developing exceptional quality programs in Canada and around the world. And this webinar is brought to you by the Municipalities for Climate Innovation Program, a Government of Canada funded initiative designed to help communities cope with the challenges and opportunities posed by climate change through capacity building exercise, knowledge sharing, and direct funding. And if you would like to be more actively involved in Canada's municipal climate discussion, I would encourage you all to attend the Sustainable Communities Conference in Ottawa next week held at the Western Hotel. So just to give a brief overview of today's webinar, I'll be uh, providing a bit of a climate change 101, um, what climate change is and what it means for municipalities. And then we'll have two presentations on local climate actions uh, delivered by Mayors Trevor Birch and Bob Young. Um, following that, we'll have a brief uh, question period and then a couple wrapping up remarks. So for today's speakers, um, Mayor Trevor Birch is a sixth generation Woodstock resident who has been engaged in the community all his life. Prior to being elected, Trevor worked as a financial analyst at the County of Oxford for 11 years and holds a certified municipal officer designation from AMCTO, a comprehensive accreditation program for Canadian municipal leaders. Fiscal responsibility, transparency, and energy leadership are all topics he has expressed as mandates for his role as Mayor of Woodstock and as a councillor for Oxford County. And Mayor Bob Young is serving his first term as Ludwig's Mayor, having previously served as a city councillor since 2004. An avid volunteer in local sporting organizations, Bob has lived in Liduc since 1962, working for most of his career as a teacher. A veteran of at least 16 municipalities and boards prior to, prior to assuming his new office, Bob is at streamlining the efficient delivery of municipal services and economic diversification as objectives for his role as mayor. So before we get into the experiences of Leduc and uh, Woodstock, I wanted to offer the opportunity to share some of the context for this discussion and why it's so important that we engage with municipal leaders. So for the, the little bit about climate change physics 101, um, energy given off by the sun is absorbed and radiated as heat, some of which is then trapped by the climate system's greenhouse effect. While the greenhouse effect is essential for life on Earth, our enhancing its potency through the emissions of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane means more heat is being retained by the climate system. Human activities, primarily the burning of fossil fuels for energy, have increased the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to levels not seen in millions of years. More energy is now entering the climate system than is leaving it, and this radiation imbalance is causing the Earth to warm, which drives other changes within the climate system. And one thing I like to bring up when discussing this science is it's really not new. The physics and chemistry supporting anthropogenic climate change were broadly laid out during the 19th century. In fact, we've been studying the foundations of the climate then longer than we've been studying the atom, plate tectonics, or evolution. But understanding that we're playing a role in climate change isn't sufficient. We need to better understand the broader picture of forcing acting upon the climate system. To this end, scientists have, have for decades been looking at the respective roles of human and natural factors have played at driving a warming trend, and a cl clear consensus of evidence has emerged. Only greenhouse gas emissions can account for the warming we've experienced. In a t uh, 2013 assessment report by the Intergovernmental, um, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it was noted that our actions are responsible for virtually all recent warming. And the consequences of these long noted concerns by scientists are very clearly evident, uh, with the planetary warming signal being the most apparent indicator. All five of the warmest years on record have occurred since 2010, and the 15 warmest have occurred in the last 20. And the implications of this increasing heat content can be seen throughout the climate system. From a shrinking cryosphere to a stressed biosphere, and encroaching hydrosphere to an atmosphere on steroids, our fingerprints are all over a fundamentally changed world. And to give one example, parts of eastern Canada have seen the volume of rain falling in extreme precipitation events increase by about 70% from 1958 to 2012. But it's not only these 
big picture challenges that can seem sort of abstract at the local level that make climate change such a priority concern for municipalities. Tracking disaster payouts offers a reasonable indication of both the increasing severity of climate impacts and the growing need for concerted efforts to improve resilience. And to highlight the scale of the issue, a 2016 report by a coalition of insurers found that the global protection gap, the difference between the cost of natural disasters and the amount insured, has grown, by about, or has grown to about $100 billion a year, placing an enormous financial burden on the public sector. But being the first line of defense to residents against climate impacts is also raising municipalities to new standards of responsibility. An, in, an increasing trend of looking to apply negligence claims against municipal and other government ag agencies following abnormal events shows that the implications do not cease with the cost in operational recovery of a disaster. While a precedent has not yet been set in a finding of guilt, the ability to demonstrate that your municipality is taking action to address a known problem is the most effective safeguard against adverse findings. So the degree to which we change the climate, and by association, the degree of change we must ultimately accommodate uh, through actions like preparing long lived infrastructure to severe events, is ultimately a product of the quantity of greenhouse gases we emit into the atmosphere, something we've already, been, we've already increased by more than 40% in the last 150 years or so. The main determining factor between these two projections on this slide is our collective will to act. And this is an area where the international community has been making progress. Backed by one of the most robust scientific assessment processes ever replied, the United Nations has hosted more than two decades of rigorous negotiations towards greenhouse gas reduction agreements, including the recent Paris Agreement, a treaty of pledges encompassing all but one certain country in the world. While the targets set under the Paris Agreement are not currently transformative enough to limit us to less than the two degree warming target identified by the international communi community, it demonstrates marked progress in building the necessary momentum for socio-technological change. And the role of municipalities here really can't be overstated. In Canada, municipalities have direct or indirect influence over about 50% of greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a comp or it is completely unrealistic to suggest that Canada can achieve its uh, national emissions targets solely through the action of provincial and federal governments and absent municipal buy-in. And this is a fact that's readily acknowledged. As indicated by the specific um, inclusion of the role of municipalities in the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change, which is the most holistic approach to climate action in the Canadian policy landscape. And the framework is also a key mechanism for municipalities to leverage support for transformative solutions. The federal government has highlighted opportunities for funding through green, infra green infrastructure integrated bilateral agreements, the Low Carbon Economy Fund, the Impact Canada Fund, the Canada Infrastructure Bank, and the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund to help uh, meet the priorities of this framework. In addition, programs like SEM's Green Municipal Fund are always available to pioneer new approaches. So one avenue uh, for action through which municipalities can address climate change is through the development and implementation of dedicated plans, such as around the management of energy within a city, of sewer use, uh, the application of zoning in floodplains, transit planning, or holistic plans around climate change mitigation and adaptation. Municipalities can also participate in programs like FCM's Partners for Climate Protection Programs, uh, which offers a venue for collaboration, recognition, and knowledge sharing amongst peers. So the rest of this webinar will, de uh, will detail two Canadian examples of municipalities implementing these sorts of approaches and some of the best practices that um, municipalities in Canada can hope to emulate. So with that, I will invite Mayor Trevor Birch to proceed with uh, a case study of what um, Woodstock, Ontario and the County of Oxford are doing around climate change mitigation. Thank you very much, Dustin. That was a great introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. 
Uh, I'd like to start off by saying that uh, I have been mayor of the city of Woodstock just over three years. And where our story will begin today will be um, a few years before being elected. One day I came home from work and my oldest of three children, my daughter, she was in tears. She was crying. I asked her what was wrong. She told me that she was learning about climate change at school and that it was very scary. And I expressed my concern with her and I asked why she was crying. It was a very large subject and one where one person wouldn't be able to change things right away. And she expressed that she learned that it was wrong to cut down trees. And when she came home and saw that our house was made out of wood, she was very upset. So I proceeded to take our three children to a farm that has been in our family for many generations. We're in southwestern Ontario, where much of the land, when settlers came, was covered in mixed deciduous forest. Now this particular farm, it was part of a grass plain loamy area, no trees. So early settlers planted tobacco. And I explained to my children that during World War II, a great uncle of theirs that wanted to leave a legacy for the future, he invited the one-room schoolhouse to come out and plant trees. I pointed to trees that were planted by their grandfather, by their uncles, by their aunt. And I explained how there was enough wood there to build houses for all of their children and for my children. I explained that toilet paper came from trees. I then pointed to trees that when I was a teenager, I planted with my friends. And the children were very excited. They were learning about stewardship in a very positive fashion. Before we left, they were asking, how soon can they plant trees? And this is something I have seen in our community. We see people who believe in teaching in the positives, not in the negatives. When you speak about clean air, clean water, and the protection of resources, people are very receptive. And I'd ask you all to consider if you go to Google and punch in some different words on climate change, if you punch in climate change denial, you will see over 14 million results. Climate change skeptics, 774,000 results. And the one I've circled here in red, this is the scary one. Climate change, depression, anxiety. There are scientists all over the world and researchers and concerned people who have been studying climate that right now are faced with such mental anguish of what the future generations have in store that they have hurt themselves, they have resigned from their positions, or maybe even taken their own life. But the two below, these are the positives. Punch in environmental stewardship or environmental sustainability, and you'll see almost 200 million results. And this is where people speak about what we can do to make a difference. Shortly before I was elected, our community started a grassroots study on a community sustainability plan. This included academics, it included activists, environmentalists, social advocates, industry, the local chamber of commerce, as well as utilities, retired farmers, mothers, and children. What we discovered was that the community had a clear path in an ecological sense where they viewed the environmental goals as well as the community goals and the economy goals all having similarities. And some of you will recognize this graph here from your science classes. It covers all aspects 
of what local government can touch. Shortly after all of this work from all of these amazing people in our community, I was elected to office. And looking at the preliminary results of this future Oxford plan, I saw 70 action items. And right away I zeroed in on one that was near and dear to my heart, which was energy. Shortly after taking the oath of office, I went out to Vancouver and I was able to meet with Mayor Gregor Robertson, with partners who have been working hard for many years to shed light on everything that's going on with climate change. And what I learned there was that we're not alone and there's so many individuals who have been inspiring and collaborating together and the thing I learned the most was the power of story. In a sense, the blinders came off my eyes. When I returned to my community, I saw all the great things that were going on. The committee that we founded, Smart Energy Oxford, I love that name because we surrounded ourselves with smart people that are doing great things one step at a time. Those partnerships, I want you to think about all of the people who have been working, doing the science, doing the advocacy, doing the hard work about what we're trying to accomplish by combating climate change here in Canada, in our local municipalities. Great people like the David Suzuki Foundation and Greenpeace, Federation of Canadian Municipalities, as well as all of the different research institutions. And I have to tip my hat to Simon Fraser University, Stanford University, and York University for helping me see that by telling these positive stories, I could help impact community and showcase all of the things that we were doing well so we could try to inspire others. In short, our timeline, we passed a 100% renewable energy goal for 2050 in June of 2015. And this motion was unanimously supported by all of the mayors in our regional government. And I would say that the way we had that unanimous support was by showcasing the great people that are innovating. In our area, here in southwestern Ontario, our two main industries are automotive and agriculture. And at the same time as we were setting our goal, we saw one of our local industries, the world's largest auto manufacturer, also setting a goal. And when I spoke with executives at Toyota, asking about what their plan would be. They were just starting to work on their plan. They were excited to hear that we set the same goal as them. Fast forward a year to June 22nd of 2016, and we released what we call our draft 100% renewable energy plan for public review and comment. And even to this day, we call it a draft. We continue to collaborate we continue to work with others and make refinements. And at this point in time, Toyota has also released their plan. And one thing that I give them great credit for is that within their plan, they speak about the technologies of the future that have not been released yet. This is a big issue that we're dealing with. And we have to focus on the positives. We have to take the right steps today even if we know that we can't make it to the finish line yet. And what's come about from that great collaboration, we have so many other committees, each forming a special piece in climate change action. We have Reforest Oxford, Zero Waste Oxford, Economy Oxford, Community Oxford, Environment Oxford, again, members of the community volunteering their time to help communicate and celebrate the successes we have and to help inspire our neighbors 
those here in the province of Ontario, as well as all across Canada and internationally. And I say that it is very important to celebrate these successes. If you look at this slide here in the top left corner, you'll see the car that I was driving around to community events. I would leave it parked by the front entrance with the hood open so people could see what an electric car looked like. We hosted community events where people could come and showcase their technologies and students could come and learn and share ideas. We have had partners from business, industry, politicians, citizens, and we continue to celebrate. One of the ways we've accomplished this is through community involvement and education. These are some pictures from our Woodstock Art Gallery where our manager of strategic initiatives and my partner and co-chair on Smart Energy Oxford tours school children and shows them the art in sustainable energy and how they can do their part to help educate their parents and the previous generation and help fight climate change. We need to inspire that next generation and help them change the current generation. In this slide, if you start at the top left, it's a simple story. I tell young people, go to the library with your library card, check out some books on all things sustainability, and check out an easy watt meter while you're there. When you go home, talk to your parents about an agreement for an energy allowance. If you can demonstrate how you can save phantom power and still maintain a great quality of life, you'll make money and you'll save money for your parents. The important thing with that is the children get excited and they continue the process. They get out more books. And what you see in the bottom left-hand corner is the end result. Parents who have decided to put solar panels on the roof of the house. Parents who have decided to trade in that second vehicle for an electric car. We share our stories and we continue to refine that plan and we continue to repeat. Here's an example of a partnership we've created, the International Renewable Energy Academy. And this is experiential learning. They come to Oxford County from all over the world, master's students and PhD students, and they get to go and see sites firsthand, things that are not uncommon within your own municipality. And they get to share ideas and collaborate, and they go home inspired to talk to their political leaders. And with that, here we are, a picture from the second time we attended in Vancouver with Mayor Gregor Robertson and Dr. Jose Echeverri. In my hands is the Municipal Energy Plan for the City of Woodstock. In Jose's hands, he has the Draft Renewable Energy Plan. And in Mayor Gregor Robertson's hands, he has the Climate Change Document and the COPE 21 Agreement that he helped spearhead. And with that, I would like to just reassure everyone, there are so many who have gone before us and we can utilize their work. We do not have to reinvent the wheel, but what we have to do is reassure people that the future has never been brighter, and we can all take steps towards sustainability that will help our local community have clean air, clean water, and resources for generations to come. Teach people to plant trees. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trevor, for that uh, moving presentation. Um, after that, I will uh, invite Mayor Bob Young to uh, give Leduc's perspective on resilience planning and climate change adaptation. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone, to climate planning in Leduc. So there are two types of plans generally recognized in the climate planning world, adaptation plans made to prepare for changes in weather and climate patterns and extreme weather events. Mitigation plans made to reduce greenhouse gases for transitioning Leduc to a low-carbon, climate-resilient, and environmentally sustainable community. 
For example, uh, promoting the increased use of our public transit to reduce carbon emissions from vehicles. So Leduc is located um, near the Edmonton International Airport. High, Highway 2 is the main corridor between Edmonton and Calgary, and it runs through the center of our city. So transportation is important to Leduc's viability, and it is also a source of greenhouse gas emissions. Our population has more than doubled over the last decade. Our city council had a question. Was environmental planning a priority or not? To answer this, we established a council advisory board that helped decide that it was a priority in our community. Then we hired an environmental sustainability coordinator in 2010. She helped define and bring environmental issues to the table. Prior to 2010, there wasn't total council support for spending on environmental policies and programs. Over time, the actions taken helped council see the benefits to the community. We had some quick wins. The curbside blue bag program, participation rates were high when it was implemented. We also had the community tree planting events. We sponsored tree planting events uh, since 2006, and it has become more and more popular this year. Council approved our environmental plan in 2012. It laid out a 10-year City of Leduc vision for the environment. It clearly stated the short, medium, and long-term actions we needed to take and the expected costs. This helped uh, to increase the profile of environmental initiatives with Council and the community, creating a brand, reporting publicly on progress, and celebrating success were key starting points. Our new waste diversion program was implemented. This included curbside organics and enhanced eco-station services. The community started to appreciate council support for these types of initiatives. It helped them to envision Leduc becoming a green city. Under city leadership, we developed a climate change readiness plan to understand any implications of climate change to Leduc and what we should do to be prepared. We called it the Weather and Climate Plan. It was focused on short-term short -term local weather events as well as longer-term predicted changes to our climate. We chose to start with the adaptation planning to increase awareness and support for action. Council wasn't sure whether climate change was an issue for Leduc or whether we should allocate tax dollars towards greenhouse gas reduction actions. Staff told us that climate change was going to happen whether we reduce greenhouse gases or not. So we wanted to prioritize our resources to be prepared for any changes in the future. Examples of extreme weather, such as the flooding in Calgary, the fires in Fort McMurray in California, made climate change more of a real issue and reinforced the need to be prepared. With the help of consultants, we brought together staff from many of our departments to identify risks and actions to address them. We identified potential weather risks to Leduc, high wind events, snow loading, extreme precipitation, drought, tornadoes, thunderstorms, freezing rainstorms, heat waves, freeze-thaw cycles, winter storms, hailstorms, and grass fires. We needed to rank these risks to prioritize actions. In this risk matrix, yellow identifies the top two weather events that are the highest risk to Leduc. The first one was freezing rainstorms, and second, extreme precipitation and flooding. We've had examples of these in recent examples. So freezing rainstorms have caused multiple car accidents on Highway 2, and heavy rainfall has caused flooding in certain neighborhoods. This is an example of our action plan relating to extreme precipitation and flooding. The plan identifies the expected budget required. Each year, Council has a chance to re-examine the costs in more detail during our budget deliberations. We've started implementing the last two actions related to engineering standards for our uh, storm ponds. So lessons learned. 
get adaptations or readiness planning on the radar if it's not already, integrate with your emergency planning process, tailor the plan to your municipality, and take implementation step by step. Our next focus is towards climate mitigation strategies. We have received an FCM Municipal Climate Innovation Program grant for the development of our local greenhouse gas action plan. We have completed our greenhouse gas inventory and we've just begun planning for our consultation on the plan. Thank you. I'd like to uh, be glad to answer any questions. And if you uh, have any more information you require, uh, please feel free to contact uh, Kara Chomlak. She's our Environmental Sustainability Coordinator at the City of Leduc. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. So we will now open up the floor to questions to either of Mayor, either Mayor's. Um, Young or Birch, or if you have any about Federation of Municipalities or the Municipalities for Climate Innovation Program, I'd be happy to answer them as well. You can submit them in the uh, questions and comments box to the left side of the webinar screen. So while we um, while we give the participants a moment to think over some questions, I'll ask you both. Uh, um, just one to get you going. If you had 30 seconds in an elevator with Justin Trudeau to make your pitch on the need for uh, or on the need to support municipal leadership on climate change, what would you say? Um, Bob, why don't we start with you? Well, thank you. So I would ask uh, Prime Minister Trudeau to allocate additional resources to emergency preparedness. With the increase in extreme weather due to climate change, Municipalities are going to face higher costs and require federal support. Whether it's flooding, fires, ice storms, or high wind storms, costs will be high. And a coordinated effort will be required by all levels of government to ensure that there are enough resources to address these issues. Okay, thank you. And how about yourself? Trevor, what would you say to the Prime Minister? I would uh, encourage the Prime Minister on his own remarks that he has given at FCM in the past, that municipalities are the lifeblood of our communities, and that we can wave the federal government's program and the flag very high by harnessing the efforts that are needed, that are unique for each municipality across all of this great country. Okay, thank you. So we've received our first question, and this one's for you, Bob. And given the, um, it comes from the city of Oshawa, and um, how is the municipality taking into consideration um, the, um, uh, the oil and gas activity and production um, in local climate change actions? Thank you. So uh, oil and gas is an important industry in the Leduc and Alberta area. And so what we are doing is we're involving all stakeholders to come up with innovative uh, solutions. Um, we're looking at reasonable targets for reducing uh, our greenhouse gases. And we're doing step-by-step -step actions. OK, thank you. So, uh, okay, so um, so a question came through from a uh, city councillor. Um, so, as an environmentally conscious councillor in a community that is current that currently is largely agricultural, it has been potential for significant development and growth. I do support adaptation and mitigation, but governments never seem to address growth in and of itself as a risk factor in climate change. I believe growth projections need to recognize that growth is, is a significant climate change risk factor. Um, do either of you have some perspective as to 
why growth is not identified as a risk factor in climate change planning? Well, I guess if I could start, I would say that from our perspective here in Oxford County, and we have a very large agricultural base as well, we're recognized as the dairy capital of Canada, and yet we were on the uh, crossroads of the major highways that uh, service the eastern seaboard of North America. So the pressure on growth is real, and we have identified that uh, through the sustainability plan. The community has made it loud and clear, and within our review of the official plan, we are looking at sustainable growth options and recognizing that we need to work with our stakeholders in the agricultural sector, but also help celebrate their successes uh, on some of these family-run farms. The output is now double and triple what it was 30 years ago. And we also need to be able to have houses for children and grandchildren that decide that farming is not their career and they're going to become school teachers and lawyers and doctors and want to be in an urban setting. So within all of that planning on where new development will go, we take a look at what is the most productive use of the land while still protecting our environmental roots in agriculture. That's a tough question. Population growth is really important and we're trying to reduce uh, emissions per person. Um, one of the ways that we're doing this is by increasing our uh, density. Um, we're also trying to preserve farmland, again, an important source for uh, food production. And we're developing strategies to reduce the uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, from those farming operations as well. But this is one of the, the biggest challenge, challenges that uh, I believe we're going to face. Uh, it amazes me that uh, last year I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to travel in Europe and you see the number of people um, that live in uh, very dense population centers and they have the ability to go down, uh, they don't have to use vehicles, um, they have uh, uh, very efficient transit systems and the food they need is available uh, usually uh, across the block or right next door. So I think eventually we will move to a uh, uh, model like that, but right now, it, it, Canada, is, we have a lot of distances uh, between communities and, uh, you know, unfortunately, we, we aren't able to uh, have the type of uh, transit uh, facilities that uh, uh, they do in higher populated areas. Okay, thank you. Um, so a question has come in for, uh, to both of you from Alberta Municipal Affairs. Um, both Leduc and uh, Woodstock are medium-sized municipalities and clearly lack the internal capacity for to kind of pioneer the really flashy approaches that uh, something like the City of Vancouver can, given just the uh, additional resources and capacity available to it. So the question is, municipal capacity seems to be a challenge to deal with climate change. Um, what are both of your perspectives on this and how to address capacity issues? Well, I'll jump in first on that one. Um, in the one slide where I showed uh, all of the different collaboration and all of those logos, if I had a little more time and a little more uh, internet savvy, I could have put together a series of slides that would show about 300 different partnerships. So this is why I really stress that there are amazing people doing a lot of great work and they've spent a lot of years on this and you do not have to go it alone. Collaboration is the key and even when you come from a small municipality that has uh, capacity challenges, there are still items that you can bring to the table that will help fill in some of the empty spots that others have been working on so that collaboration gets taken up a level and your leadership will be something that helps inspire others. Yeah, the <clears throat> what we're doing in the uh, Leduc region is that there's 23 municipalities around Edmonton and what we've done is we are starting to collaborate. In Alberta, 
uh, just as uh, Mayor Trevor mentioned, collaboration is a key. And so we have formed the Edmonton uh, Metropolitan Region Board, and all the communities are working together um, to try and solve some of the problems that we're talking about today. Again, uh, Leduc, we don't have the capacity, but if we collaborate with all our, our municipalities uh, that are neighboring, um, we're able to deal with these problems in a much more effective way. Okay, thank you very much. Um, received a question around um, just um, trying to change perception um, among your residents. Uh, question is, what is the message you are sending to your residents to adjust behaviors uh, that were considered acceptable in the past, but in today's reality may need to be adjusted? So providing some examples, um, moving to renewable energy, such as solar, reducing water usage, um, reducing electrical usage. How are you trying to influence behaviors towards uh, more sustainable alternatives? Well, I can take this one first. So in the city of Leduc, we're trying to stay positive, And what we're doing is we're trying to uh, focus on opportunities and not challenges. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, here in Oxford, what we have been working on uh, over a number of years now has been um, creating an awareness towards conservation. So in the past, our municipal water systems were a flat rate water system. And we provided a lot of education regarding conservation, you know, for lawn watering, car washing, etc. And then we instituted water meters across the board, residential, commercial, industrial. And uh, what we have seen is that people are, are taking more ownership over their own private use of these services. Another example was on uh, waste management. When faced with uh, uh, capacity at our local landfill, the politicians decided between a carrot and a stick, and they decided on the stick in the form of a bag tag, uh, a sticker that's a, a tax that you place on your bag of garbage. And if there's no tag, the garbage will not be picked up. So again, this put ownership over the individuals. And we now see more recycling, more backyard composting. And the life of our landfill in the last 10 years has been extended by more than 40 years. Oh, wonderful. And uh, Trevor, we, we received a question from the City of Oshawa. Just wondering if you could expand expand a little more about the 100% renewable energy by 2050 um, uh, resolution. Yes. So uh, on, on the slide deck at the end, I give a, a couple of the websites, Smart Energy Oxford as well as Future Oxford, and you'll be able to see the uh, energy plan there. Um, but in a nutshell, what we're talking about is that we want to produce more energy in our uh, county than what we consume. So, and this includes uh, from uses for industry, home heating, as well as transportation. And so one of the stops that the International Renewable Energy Academy has really enjoyed is the biodigester located just outside of our city and uh, they really enjoy talking to the farmer there. Uh, his name is amazing. It is Mr. Green at Green Home Farms. And he is using the waste from his dairy operation to power all of the energy needs on his farm, including the electricity, as well as biofuels to run the tractors. So when we talk to school children, we talk about the future being instead of importing diesel fuel to run tractors and transport trucks up and down township roads, we talk about uh, a circular economy where the waste from the dairy becomes the fuel that picks up the milk. OK, thank you. And that actually leads extremely well into the next question we received. Uh, Bob, why don't we start with you on this one? Um, how do you see the role of schools in the future of environmental initiatives? 
Well, I think that uh, schools are an important part. Um, when I grew up, um, most of the kids in my class smoked. And I think that the education program that we put in place to show um, the uh, harmful effects for smoking, um, I think the majority of kids in, uh, in, in the classroom now uh, do not smoke. And I think that uh, if we're going to uh, uh, really make changes in our future for environmental uh, initiatives, that I think the schools play a very, very important part. Um, one of the things uh, we are looking at doing is developing a game that uh, helps kids uh, sort the uh, trash and so that we can uh, increase the amount of waste diversion instead of um, taking it to our landfill and burying it. Um, we want to recycle and reuse as uh, many of the materials as we can. So I, I really look at the future of uh, uh, the environmental change um, being the education system. And I, I would agree uh, wholeheartedly with Mary Young's comments, and I'll, I'll continue on along the waste side. Uh, myself, uh, when my wife and I were first married uh, almost 19 years ago, I remember putting out a bag of garbage every week. And then as children came along and diapers and packaging, some weeks there were a couple of bags. And uh, it wasn't that many years ago that I was uh, doing laundry on a weekend and I was taking clothes out of the washer to put them in the dryer and my children saw me empty the lint tray and I put that dryer lint in the garbage can. And there were my children saying, no daddy, lint is good fiber for the garden. It goes in the compost. So here we are today, a family of five, and we put out probably about 16 bags of garbage a year. So certainly marked improvement. Well done. Um, I think we'll make this the last question because it uh, certainly aligns well with uh, the FCM vision in total. Um, so again, from the Alberta Municipal Affairs, uh, can the presenters talk about the relationship with the provincial and federal governments when working on their initiatives? Um, are these higher orders of government hindering municipalities in reaching their goals, or are they helping? Well, uh, I can jump in on this one. Yep, the uh, City of Leduc, uh, we've been working uh, with our provincial government. Uh, we received a grant and w that allowed us to install uh, one of the largest solar collectors on our Leduc Recreation Centre. And uh, we've, we've had it operating for almost a year now and it's uh, actually exceeded our, our first uh, estimates for the amount of uh, power that it would generate. And so uh, the more uh, initiatives that we can do uh, with the provincial government, it um, reduces our demand for increasing the amount of uh, electrical generation plants for the province. And so uh, we've been really happy with the uh, uh, working with the provincial government. Um, I'm, I'm looking at right now at uh, different ways that we can uh, interact with the federal government and uh, hopefully in the future we'll be able to come up with some projects with them as well. So I would say from our perspective here, there has been uh, a lot of activity uh, definitely with the provincial government uh, as they recognize the, the leadership role that we've been taking and the encouragement that we've been giving others and they see the involvement in our community. When they're looking at developing uh, new policies, we are sitting at the table with the policy uh, individuals and uh, sharing our ideas and we can see the fruit of this in many forms. Uh, a good example is the uh, long-term energy plan for the province of Ontario and specifically within that plan Oxford County is referenced several times for some of the uh, pilot projects and initiatives that are on the go. And uh, I can remember back to two years ago when the climate change document was coming out, uh, there was a, a little bit of a leak from cabinet and some negative press. And shortly after some interactions that we had at the legislature, uh, the, the document that came out and was passed uh, was something that was very favorable for uh, 
not just our environment, but also our local economy here in southwest Oxford. So uh, quietly behind the scenes, helping people make a step in the right direction. Okay, so thanks again to our speakers, Trevor and Bob, and thank you to you all for joining today's webinar. I wanted to encourage you once more to check out FCM Sustainable Community Conference at our website, fcm.ca slash scc. And if you have any remaining questions that we didn't get to or if they pop into your mind after this is over, feel free to email me at dcarry at fcm.ca and we'll follow up by email. Uh, for anyone who in your organizations who might be interested in this webinar but wasn't able to attend, we do plan on uploading it in about two weeks or so. So um, I'm just going to pass it off to Louise for, to close it out and to encourage you all to undertake a survey just uh, relaying your thoughts on this webinar. So thank you very much again. Oh, there you go. Thank you very much, Great Dustin. Um, to conclude the webinar, we'll take a look at our footprint module. Uh, footprint is software that calculates, um, based on the location of your internet service provider, it calculates uh, the distance that uh, would have been traveled had we met in person rather than meeting virtually by webinar. So if all of you hypothetically had come to Ottawa for a conference uh, given by mayors, uh, Trevor Birch and Bob Young, and then returned home, we would have expended 23,541 uh, kilograms of carbon dioxide, um, $49,516 in return travel expenses, and 156,417 kilometers in return um, uh, distance traveled. So by meeting virtually, um, we do manage to, uh, like I say, hypothetically uh, save uh, the environment. So I'll bring this back right now to um, Dustin's slides because he had contact information at the end of his, uh, there we go, at the end of his slides. So if any of you are interested in uh, being in touch with uh, our speakers today, you have their uh, you have phone numbers and you have 